LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, David Brooks on the art of seeing others deeply. I'm here this morning with my producer, Caleb. Good morning, Caleb. Good morning, Rufus. And the reason you asked me to be here is uh, there's something you want to confess? Indeed. Yes, there is. And this is something I've never told anyone else, Caleb. I haven't told my mother. I've never told anybody this. Wow. When I was 11 years old, I stole a Kit Kat from a convenience store. Whoa. Did you get caught? No, I, I actually got away with it, which made it worse. I had to live in secret shame for 40 years, Caleb. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous since we're talking about a 50 cent candy bar. That's, that's what they cost back then. Yeah, yeah. This was back in the 1980s, Caleb, when okay. you were uh, not with us. And uh, <laughs> things were less expensive then, but 50 cents was a lot of money. Uh, and seriously, that memory haunts me along mm. with a few dozen of my other moral failures from my past. Uh, you know, various times when I've made selfish decisions or didn't take the high road. And that's always how I've thought of morality, these moments mm-hmm. where we're tested and we're proven to be either made of the right moral stuff or the wrong stuff. Mm. I was intrigued to encounter a different view of morality last week when I read a new book by David Brooks called How to Know a Person. Let me play you a clip from the audiobook. He's talking here about the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch. She argues that morality is not mostly about abstract universal principles. Morality for her is mostly about how you pay attention to others. It means that a good person tries to look at everyone with a patient and discerning regard. That was a revelation for me, this view that the critical moral choice we each make is actually just in our daily interactions with each other. That Mm. if we choose to treat everyone, the individuals around us with patience and empathy and curiosity, everything else that matters flows from that. Hmm. And so before you, you thought that morality was about the choices we make just during climactic moments and that was kind of it. Yeah, I I did. I mean, I had this sense that that moment of weakness when I slipped the Kit Kat into my pocket, that was an immoral act. The universe was testing my moral compass, Caleb, and it turned out mine was defective. And I I, I felt the sense of of a crack in my in my hmm. morality. And so now, forty odd years later, with help from Iris and David, have you adopted this new view of morality? Has this really changed? how you approach the world and and how closely you pay attention to other people? Well, I I mean, I I would say that I certainly prefer this idea to a world in which the line between the moral and immoral individuals is those who have stolen Kit Kats versus those who have not, (laughs) (laughs) for obvious reasons. Right. But There's just a line at the pearly uh, gates in St. Peter's, like, Kit Kat stealers over here, please. (laughs) Exactly. Right. No, exactly. No, I'm I'm prepared for this. this. This is what I see coming. But- What I would say is I think there's something appealing about this idea that what really matters is is this often subtle distinction between whether we make an extra effort to see the people around us, to really Mm. listen to them, treat them with dignity. And that little distinction results in all these downstream effects uh, about how we treat others that has a profound larger impact on the world. But it's not an easy thing to do, I think, in the end. And this is something David Brooks found out in his journey writing this book and, and, and trying to evolve as a human, that resetting our thinking takes real effort. Yeah. So on the show today, he's going to teach us some of the skills that go into seeing others, understanding others, and making other people feel respected and valued. Hmm. Well, since we're confessing, uh, I think there's something I should own up to. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I'd love to hear it. (laughs) You know, going into this interview, I have to say I was not the biggest David Brooks fan. You know, I I read his columns in the New York Times, and he's a great writer, but I just had kind of written him off as a little bit of a 
soppy, kind of old-fashioned conservative. But as I listened to the two of you talk, as I got to know him a little bit in that process of hearing someone come alive through conversation, I realized like, wow, this is a guy who is soulful, he's empathetic, he's surprisingly humble for someone who's had the success that he's had. And I think for me, the biggest revelation, this is someone who I actually have a lot in common with. So it was a real about face for me listening to this. It was, it was, kind, of, it was kind of magical, actually. You might have had that feeling, Caleb, because he describes himself as a man of average intelligence with better than average communication skills. Was that did that resonate for you? It really did. I felt like he had <laughs> I felt like he had peered into my soul there. I think I have gotten away with slightly above average communication skills that have masked some some intellectual uh, weaknesses within me. Well, your reframing of David Brooks, Caleb, mm-hmm. is exactly the kind of the kind of reframing that David encourages in his book, How to Know a Person. Interesting. He says, you know, we all have a tendency to diminish other people, to quickly kind of stereotype them. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's radical to say that this is a real problem in our country right now. Mm. You, you can see it in the dismissive language we use to talk about each other. We talk about you know rednecks and coastal elites, the woke mob and Bible thumpers. I don't think David is so naive as to believe that empathy and curiosity about other people are enough to resolve the prejudices and discord we battle in the U.S. But he does believe that in this age of creeping dehumanization, anything we can do that's humanizing Anytime we can cast just and loving attention, as Iris Murdoch calls it, on other people, that's got to be a good thing. Hi, I'm Kwame Christian, CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I have a quick question for you. When was the last time you had a difficult conversation? These conversations happen all the time. And that's exactly why you should listen to Negotiate Anything, the number one negotiation podcast in the world. We produce episodes every single day to help you lead, persuade, and resolve conflicts both at work and at home. So level up your negotiation skills by making Negotiate Anything part of your daily routine. David Brooks, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you. I've brought whatever big ideas I have, I've brought them with me. Perfect. Perfect. You'll you'll need them. So you've been an opinion columnist and a news commentator with a focus on politics for as long as I can remember. And in the last decade, you've written books like The Road to Character and The Second Mountain, and now your latest How to Know a Person that are more focused on human connection, emotion, character development, meaning, purpose. To what extent is this shift about losing interest in politics or or maybe losing the team, the moderate conservatives with which you were affiliated, or perhaps about climbing a second mountain, a shift in your priorities in this phase of your life? or perhaps about working on your own personal objectives in public? Yeah, so all of the above, but uh, let's start with, uh, you know, my own personal problems. <laughs> so, you know, there's a saying, we writers work out our stuff in public. And so one of the things I've tried to do over the last 10 years is just becoming a more open human being. <laughs> and so I say in the book that if you ever watch that movie, Fiddler on the Roof, you know how huggy and emotional and warm Jewish families can be. Uh, I come from the other kind of Jewish family. So we were super cerebral. And then I went to the University of Chicago, which is a great school. I'm very proud of it, but it's super intellectual. And so I was trained to like live in my head. (laughs) But I learned if you cut yourself off from emotion uh, and from real connection with people, you've cut yourself off from maybe some pain and discomfort, but you've also cut yourself off from life itself. Uh, And so I've just tried to take a 10-year journey just to be more open and, and to be better at emotional connection and better at being a friend. So start that. But then on top, as I've tried to become a more humane person, our society has become less humane. In my job as a journalist, 
I just see an epidemic of blindness. I see people just feel invisible and unheard. And that's like black people feeling their daily life is mm. not understood by whites. Yeah. Uh, rural people in the Midwest feeling coastal elites don't see them. Lonely young people feeling nobody sees them. Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. So not only for my own sake, but for society's sake, it's just important that we get a lot better at the skills of building relationships and understanding other people. And unfortunately, we're, we're not necessarily great at this. I, I was a little disconcerted to learn in the early pages of your book that, uh, as you put it, I'm probably not as good as I think I am at reading people. None of us are, which is some consolation. And you share that uh, the social psychologist William Ikes found that strangers in the midst of a first conversation read each other accurately only about 20% of the time. And close friends and family members do so only about 35% of the time. Why are we so bad at this? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that 20% number, that's an average. So some yeah, people are 0%. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and some people are pretty good. They're 55%. So you, we vary very widely in this skill. And I'd say the the reason we're not so good, A, is natural egotism. <laughs> we're not thinking about somebody else. We're just trying to broadcast ourselves. Sometimes it's anxiety. You know, you got so much noise in your own head, you have trouble thinking about others. Sometimes we're locked into our own viewpoint and we can't see from the other people's viewpoint. And so there's a story of a guy who's on one side of the river and there's a woman on the other side of the river and she screams at him, how do I get to the other side of the river? And he screams back at her, you are on the other side of the river. Like <laughs> He can't that. put himself in her yeah. shoes. And so I, I just think we're naturally a bit self-centered. And, you know, I notice... I, I come home from parties sometimes, and I'll notice that that whole time, nobody asked me a question. Mm. And I've now started paying attention to this, and I figure like 30% of people are question askers. Like you're, When you're in conversation with them, they ask you a lot of questions. The other 70% are, are perfectly nice people. They're just not question askers. And so as a result, they don't really know much about other people. And you know, you don't need academic research to tell you this. Uh, how many times have you felt somebody didn't get you or you were misheard, misunderstood, uh, stereotyped? Uh, and it just happens all the time. And there's nothing crueler than being indifferent to another person. I fear that I have on occasion been the person at the party not asking the question. I mean, I've, I've like you, I've, I'm making progress on this front. But you can get better. I think that's the key point. And, and in the book, one of the key distinctions or dualisms I make is between diminishers and what I call illuminators. Yes. And so the diminishers are those people who, who stereotype ignore, they're not curious, they make you feel small. But illuminators are those people who are just curious about you. They're bright about you. They shine the beam of attention upon you. And they make you feel great. They make you feel lit up. And so part of the job of the book is to try to help people become illuminators and not diminishers. One of the things that I walk away from having read the book with is that being an illuminator is not only a public service, releasing a kind of contagion of affection into the world, but it's also a lot more fun. You have this wonderful description of a conversation you were having with a 93-year-old woman named Mrs. LaRue Dorsey, uh, and the way that your mutual friend, Jimmy Durrell, greeted her. And this, this really stuck with me as like a, something to strive for. Do you want to share that story? Yeah, sure. So I'm down in Waco, Texas, and I'm at a diner with this 93-year-old lady named LaRue Dorsey. And she's like presenting herself to me as like this strict disciplinarian. And so I was a little intimidated by her. And into the diner walks a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell, who's a pastor down there. He pastors to the homeless. And he sees us and he comes over to our table and he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders and shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. And he looks into her face and he says, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best. You're the best. I love you. I love you. And that stern disciplinarian that I'd been talking to turns into this bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And so it's illustrated to me the power of attention, that whenever you encounter someone, they're secretly or unconsciously asking themselves a series of questions. Am I a priority to you? Am I a person to you? And the answers to those questions will be answered by your eyes, by your gaze, before they'll be answered by your words. And the most profound thing about that little anecdote is that Jimmy's a pastor, so he's a Christian. Yeah. And so when he looks at somebody, he thinks he's looking into the face of God. 
Mm. When he's looking at somebody, absolutely anybody, he thinks he's looking at somebody made in the image of God. And so I don't care if you're a Christian, Muslim, Jew, atheist, agnostic, approaching each person you meet with that level of reverence and respect is an absolute precondition for seeing them well. And so that's the first step in getting to know someone is that initial gaze. And it turns out to be just very powerful. As you were describing that scene, there's a sense that you were looking with a bit of amazement and and maybe an aspirational quality of a student trying to learn a language you don't speak at this ability Jimmy had to take this woman who was who was kind of intimidating you a little bit <laughs> right and just and just completely transform her her state of mind i, I mean obviously you've been on a on a journey of learning have, have, have do you feel that you you've spent time in your life as both diminisher and illuminator I'm kind of a reticent, aloof guy. That's just my natural personality setting. But I find if you treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer, it helps. So if I'm going to be with you, I'm going to be 100% with you. I'm not going to be 60% with you. And I was really drawn to a philosopher named Iris Murdoch, who was a novelist and a philosopher. And he, she died probably like a, couple, a decade or two ago. And she says, attention is the primary moral act. We normally see other people in self-serving ways. How can this person help me? But if we can cast what she calls a just and loving attention on everybody we meet, then we'll be better and we'll make them feel better. And she says we can grow by looking. Attention is the first moral act before we decide to be honest or dishonest, be loving or unloving. First, it's a quality of attention. And if I look to you with critical eyes, I'm going to find flaws. And if I look at you with generous eyes, I'm going to find a person struggling to do the best they can. The way you attend to the world is the way you become in the world. I love the simplicity and humility of this point of view that that Iris expresses. You know, because because we think of we th we tend to think of morality as these kinds of pivotal decisions we make at certain moments in our lives. Do we take this action or or or, or that action? But in fact, this view is, is like, no, it's, it, it's these little choices we're making all day long about how and if we see people fully. And um, you write, evil happens, describing Murdoch's view, when people are unseeing, when people don't recognize the personhood in other human beings. So, so essentially, if we, if we make this decision to, to try to fully appreciate and see everyone in front of us, that has uh, effects down the line of, of, of really meaningfully changing how people interact. Yeah. And at the most extreme case, uh, unseeing leads to horrible massacres and murders. And, and I have a, a quote in the book from another book called Machete Season from a French journalist. And the, the French journalist was interviewing people who committed the Rwandan genocide. And he's talking to a guy who happened to take a machete to his neighbor, a guy he'd lived next to for 25 years. And the guy says, in the middle of when I picked up the machete, I looked into his face. I did not see the face I had known all those years. It was just kind of blurry. And so in that moment of genocidal rage, he is literally not seeing the face of another person. And so it's, that's the act of dehumanization of not seeing other people's faces. And to me, any act of humanism is trying to see the other's face, trying to see the world a little from their point of view. When I was in high school in, in Washington, D.C., where you are now, my father would sometimes ask me to pick up the dry cleaning or, or, or go get the car from the shop. And I, I would go and say, hey, I'm, you know, I, I'm Rufus's son. I'm here to pick up the, the dry cleaning. And the guy would say, how is your father? Please tell him that Jimmy said hi. Will you tell him that? Will you tell him that I said hi? And I said, well, well sure, yeah. And, you know, and then pick up the car. Boy, I, I, love your, I love your dad. Will you tell him that, that Lewis said hi? And so I came home and I finally said, Dad, what are you saying to all these people? He said, well, I just asked them about their lives. Yeah. And, and the notion that such a small thing could have such a, a momentous impact really, really kind of stuck with me. I'll throw out too that my father is a is a passionately religious guy. He tried his very best to raise me as an Episcopalian. <laughs> it didn't take. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't quite square religion with my you know scientific understanding of the world. And I, I think I've always seen religious belief as both a positive and negative force in the world. But when I think about the positives, I do think about individuals I've known who 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 radiate love and goodwill. 
And I wonder whether, you know, you, you talk, were talking earlier about the importance of sort of seeing the soul in the eyes of people. Do you think that is a necessary part of the equation or, or is it just additive from yeah, your perspective? I, I don't think you have to be religious to see people well. I mean, religious people, I happen to be a person of faith. We talk a lot about being good and all that, but our actual behavior is not that much better than anybody else's. So <laughs> it doesn't really take a lot of the time. But there are extraordinary examples of people who who feel like they've been lit up. And so, like, I know a guy named Pancho Arguiles who's down in Houston, and he used to run something called the Living Wheelchair Association. And they would take men who'd been paralyzed by construction accidents, mostly Latino immigrants, and they'd give them uh, wheelchairs and diapers and catheters so they could lead dignified lives. Pancho is a wonderful guy. And I once said to him, you know, you radiate holiness. And he says to me, no, I reflect holiness. That is not me. It's it's God's love coming through me. So there are beautiful individuals, but I know people. I have a friend who um, he when you he walks into a diner, he immediately makes friends with everybody in the diner, and or in the coffee shop. And then the second time he visits the coffee shop, they all think he's their best friend. And then the third time he visits the coffee shop, they all ask him to officiate their weddings. I mean, <laughs> the guy just ready. It's like exactly like your dad. Yeah, the kind yeah. of curiosity. Yeah, And in, in the book, I mentioned this guy, Dan McAdams, who studies um, sh- how people tell their life story. Mm, and yeah. So he calls them in and he has four hour sessions. He asks them, tell me about your high moments, your low moments, your turning moments. And then in the end, he gives them a check for their time. And a lot of the people just push back the check and say, I'm not taking money for this. This has been one of the best afternoons of my life. No one has ever asked me about my life story. I've to, and people just get so much satisfaction just telling a little about their life story. It's like better than money. <laughs> and and, and uh, so if you give them a chance to do that, you're giving them a gift. And then on your own end, it's just interesting because, you know, I read a lot of psychology books and history and biography each individual life I encounter is more interesting than the generalizations that scholars make about uh, these things. I, I met a woman years ago now who was a Trump supporter, uh, but she was a, a biker and a lesbian and converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. And I was like, what stereotype do you fit into? <laughs> and, <laughs> and most people are like that. We're yeah. just more complicated than our stereotypes. From my own vantage, I, I've often felt that... Uh, life is even more precious because it's temporary. In the absence of an immortal soul, we have limited time. So the urgency of celebrating each moment, each life is maybe yeah. even great. At least that, that's that been the way. For, for, for me, there hasn't been a diminishment in, in, in sort of rapture with my loss of faith at the age of 12. But I, you know, what has really struck me is this opportunity to learn from the, the Jimmy Durrells of the world and how that changes the world or, or that we experience. You know, so, so I, I think about like you, you write, some people walk into a room in a way that is warm and embracing. Others walk in looking cool and closed up. And, and I think there's a case to be made that those two people are walking into two different rooms, right? Mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, that the... I think of it almost as like, a, you, you think of the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you know, it, to look at really small subatomic particles, you have to shine a light on them and it changes them. Uh, and I think we could almost think about an interpersonal uncertainty principle that when you, the act of radiating warmth and genuine interest and care changes the room that you walk into. Right. And, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, I, I, you know, we all get in different conversations and even little micro encounters at a store over a cash register. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly we pick up on social cues. And, yeah. you know, you know, one of the things I emphasized in my earlier books were mammals. Like we, we're smelling unconsciously. So much is going on. We're smelling each other's pheromones and things like this. And somebody who, who, you know, every conversation takes place on two levels. It's the nominal subject we're talking about, but the real conversation is the flow of emotions going on underneath us, underneath that. Am I, with every comment, I'm making you feel more embraced or more threatened. Mm, and yeah. unconsciously, we're super aware of that, even if consciously yeah. we, we may not be aware. And so we're creating the context uh, in which people shine. And if you look at people like you know, I, for the book, I literally would watch Oprah interview people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she is a loud listener. Her, she, her eyes are grow when something 
exciting is happening. She's encouraging when something funny is happening. And she goes into these silences when something sad is being discussed to invite more conversation. And she's really, with her just her little gestures, she's really leading people down the road. And I think if if you're, you know, sometimes people get a chance to moderate a panel discussion or something, the moderator is the most important person in that room because they mm. set the emotional tone Interesting. for everything else. Yeah. I love this kind of midsection of the book where you really get into the nuts and bolts of, of how to have a great conversation, of what methodologies we can all use. Yeah, um, and that's one of, one of the most fun parts of researching the book was talking to all these conversation experts and just saying, give me practical tips. I just want very practical life hacks of how to do this. So, for example, one of them uh, was keep the gem statement in the center. If we're disagreeing, there's probably something deep down we agree upon. If, if my brother and I are disagreeing with how to take care of our, our dad's health care, we deep down we both want what's best for our dad. That's the gem statement. If we keep bringing that up, then we'll preserve the relationship amid the disagreement. Or don't be a topper. If you start telling me about the problems you're having with your teenager, and I, I say, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. I'm having the same problems with my teenager. It sounds like I'm trying to relate to you, but what I'm actually doing is shifting the conversation from talking about you to talking about me. So topping is bad. Uh, another thing is uh, do the looping. We, we're not as clear as we think we are, and we're not as good listeners as we think we are. So if you say something important to me, then I, I should try to paraphrase it back to you so you can clarify to make sure we really do understand each other. Uh, so do the looping. I find, especially with teenagers, mm. you got to do a lot of looping. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, that's why well, I need that advice. I have three of them right now. Um, <laughs> okay, congr good luck with that. Yes, yes congratulations <laughs> and commiserations are in order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the don't be a topper was one that I, uh, I found particularly disheartening because those have been moments in conversations where I thought I was doing the right thing, right? And, and I guess I would push back a little bit on the topper thing because I think sometimes saying like, oh, wow, I completely relate with what you're saying. I've, I've been experiencing something similar recently. I, I, I mean, it, it strikes me that it's somewhat of a question of, ha of how you do it, right? Yeah. And I guess I would say, I would say, yes, I'm having trouble with my Tommy or whatever. And then I would ask you another question about right, your situation. Right, right. And I find when you get people who are great listeners, they ask different versions of the same question three times in a row. And so they'll say, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, how do you do this? Oh, no, really? And then tell me yeah. more about that. Or what am I missing here? And so they get you to go deeper than you expect to go in a conversation. And the new things come out in that third answer. And, uh, another one that I love is, is don't fear the pause. We all have this tendency to stop listening partway through somebody else's statement because we're busy formulating our response. We're using the same parts of our brain to formulate our response that we would properly use to, if we were attentively listening. And so I love this advice of waiting a few seconds, if necessary, raising your hand to sort of signal, I'm, I'm digesting and processing what you said, and then formulate your response. That, that's so powerful. Yeah, I, but apparently the Japanese culture is more comfortable with those pauses. That I, I read, I think, in a book called Kate Murphy's book, uh, You're Not yeah. Listening to Me, um, that their a Japanese is comfortable with eight-second pauses. Uh, and you don't want to do that all the time, but I have a friend, not in Japan, but in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and when you talk to him, he raises the hand, and he, he honors you yeah. with, with that pause. Now, sometimes if we're having like a witty conversation, we don't want to be a pause. We just want to like leap in on top of each other. But, but if it's something serious, then that pause is a sign of respect and a sign. I'm really taking this seriously. I'm, I'm thinking this through. I'm really listening all the way, hundred percent to you. Yeah. What, what I really love is this notion of, um, helping to co-author a new idea that, you know, th this sense of, of being kind of deeply engaged in a, a collaborative exercise to just explore ideas. And you had this wonderful description of, of this early 20th century British statesman, Arthur Balfour, I think it was, right? Who, who was known as a great conversationalist. And you wrote that he would take the hesitating remark of a shy man and discover in it unexpected possibilities. He would probe it and expand it until its author felt that he had really made some contribution to human wisdom and, and he would leave walking on air, <laughs> right? Yeah. That that's a that's that's a a wonderful thing to be able to do. Yeah, and we we think of pe great conversations as people who say witty things or profound right. things, but really there are people who are, have the ability to receive you and then lead us all on a a joint exploration 
there's a, another story I have in the book, which as I say in the book is, could be apocryphal, but is still instructive. And that's the story of Jenny Jerome, who later would become the mother of Winston Churchill. But when she was a young woman in the late 19th century, she was invited at a dinner party and was seated next to William Gladstone, who was prime minister. Oh yeah. And she left that dinner party thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. And then a couple of weeks later, she happens to be seated next to Benjamin Disraeli, Gladstone's great rival. And she left that dinner with Disraeli thinking that she was the cleverest person in England. Yeah. So it's good to be Gladstone. It's better to be Disraeli. To, if people leave the party thinking, wow, I'm so interesting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you, you've done something nice for somebody and you've probably learned a lot. Well, and then, and then one other uh, recommendation you make is to ask big questions. And you suggest questions like, what crossroads are you at? Uh, if you died tonight, what would you regret not doing? Maybe sometimes we feel that asking these kinds of large questions is off-putting or, but in practice, people respond pretty well, you found. Yeah. And I think we're too shy rather than too invasive in conversation. Now, kids are really direct question answers, askers. One of my favorite stories in the book is comes from a friend of mine named Naomi Way, who was teaching eighth grade boys how to do interviews for to like journalists. And the first time she does this, she says to the boys, okay, you can ask me anything and I'll answer honestly. And the first question out of a boy's mouth is, well, are you married? She says, no. Second question, are you divorced? She says, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Third question, do you still love him? And she's like, has her breath sucked out of her lungs? Because it's a, such a direct question. She says, yes. <laughs> then another student says, do you, does he know? Do your kids know? Like kids are phenomenal at asking questions. We get a little shy about it. And of course, that's appropriate. When you first meet somebody, you want it to be a shallow conversation. Like I'll ask people, where are you from? Because uh, I, I learn a lot from where people grow up or where'd you get your name? That gets people talking about their families. But after you've established trust and people are comfortable with each other, then you can ask those bigger questions. Um, if this five years is mm -hmm. a chapter in your life, um, what's the chapter about? Or, um, uh, you know, what what's a commitment you've made that you no longer really believe in? Can you be yourself where you are and still fit in? And so, like, I was at a dinner party, um, well, two dinner, two different dinner parties, one with this retiring academic. He was 80, and he, he's, he was still in good health. He said, what should I do with the rest of my career? And that was a big question. And we had a great conversation about his interests, but also about what old age should look like uh, and how you want to finish off your life. Uh, it was a great conversation. Another time... Uh, we're at a dinner party and I ask people a, wife, a question my wife always makes fun of me for asking, uh, how do your ancestors show up in your life? Mm -hmm. And yeah. around that dinner table, there was a Dutch family. I think there was an African-American couple. There were people mm -hmm. from all sorts of different backgrounds. And we all got to talk about our heritage, our grandparents, our ancestors, because we've all been shaped by all those things that happened for centuries leading up to our own birth. And so it was fun for each of us to like, None of us had a clear answer, but we could explore. In your journey as a as a conversationalist, one sense one gets reading the book is that you go to a lot of dinner parties, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> uh, it's my hobby. I used to play golf. Now I like to hang out with people. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I, I, it's what we should do. And when you reflect on your journey as a conversationalist, do you practice all the all that which you preach in the book when it comes to ha how to how to have conversations? I wish. Like I learned all these things and some of the times I really do it, but sometimes I'll be out with people at a bar or something and I'll have a drink, a glass of wine. Suddenly I'm 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 on broadcast mode. I'm telling <laughs> I'm telling stories more than I should. I'm talking more than I should. I'm asking less than I should. So uh, I, I, I struggle. I I think I'm better. <laughs> and you know, I yeah. I started out in my 20s or in my 30s as someone who was extremely good at avoiding intimacy. And if you made some confession to me about something in your life, I like would avert my eyes and quickly make an appointment with my dry cleaner. I'd like get the hell out of there. Uh, but now I'm, I'm a lot better at like wanting to stay in that moment, wanting to appreciate it and be more o emotionally open. I was at a, a conference a couple years ago and it was sort of a loosey goosey conference and we're in a group of people and they hand us out these lyric sheets and they say, turn to a stranger around you and sing this song into that person's eyes. 
And if you had asked me to do that when I was 30, <laughs> my head would have exploded. I, like, there's no way I'm staring into the eyes of some stranger and singing a love song. Yeah. But I did it. Yeah, so that was a, a mark of I was a merit badge for David Brooks' personal growth, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're and you're you survived the experience, and you're you're here to I survived. Here, here I wouldn't to, want to do to it too back. often. <laughs> do you think that we should be in some more organized fashion teaching these kinds of interpersonal skills? Yeah, I I think we should teach it at school almost. Like yeah. our schools are prepare us for a career, but if you want to know what's going to make you happy in life. Like your, the quality of your marriage will be four times more important than your career. The quality of your friendships will be four times more important than your career. So we should train people to be good spouses, to be good friends, to be good neighbors. Yeah. Uh, and somehow uh, we just don't do it. I saw a study just in the last couple of weeks and they were looking at, there were a lot of guys who've never had a, a date. They've never had a date. They've never had a romantic relationship uh, with a man or a woman. And they looked at them and figured out why. And the number one answer was, Poor flirtation skills. And so, <laughs> yeah. we don't think like flirtation is a skill we're going to teach at school. But it no. actually turns out to be important that if you're, if you're good right. at being flirtatious, you're going to probably have more romantic relationships than yeah. you would otherwise. And I, just, you know, I don't know if we ever taught these skills. I sort of think we did. We were in com enmeshed in communities where these sorts of things were just were in the water. But maybe they got outdated. Or maybe uh, our society just got too complicated. You know, we evolved to be in bands of 150 people, more or less like ourselves. And now we're in these wonderful, diverse, big communities. And maybe our social skills are inadequate for that diversity. And so I, you know, my book is an attempt to try to teach these skills. But I would love to see somebody develop a high school curriculum just so young boys and girls don't have to go through these. It's going to be awkward. The adolescence is going to be awkward. But maybe it could be less awkward if they knew how to flirt. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if the art of flirting was one of the sections of the of the interpersonal skills course, I'm sure that it would be popular. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Although exactly. it's less popular, I found, when it comes from your father. I've, I, I have three teenage sons, and I, I, I'd said to them, okay, if you want to flirt with girls, for starters, it helps to talk with them. One of the blessings and curses of being in New York is that you are at restaurants and the tables are so close together, you overhear the other conversations. And the number of times I've been at a table with somebody and then the next table over is clearly a first date. And usually it's the guy doing 90% of the talking. And I just want to take a fork and yam it into his <laughs> neck and say, ask her a question, just one question. <laughs> but he's like thinking he's going to impress her by talking and talking and talking about himself. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not, so there's more flirtation skills that need to be taught. Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spart wherever you enjoy podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. You have a wonderful section about the importance of learning how to tell the story of our lives. Do you want to share share that? Well, this is another skill they should teach at school. Like, yeah. how do you tell your story? You can't know who you are unless you know what your story is. And you can't know what to do unless you know what story you're a part of. And so it's just very important to know how to tell the story of your life. And when stories go wrong, people go to therapy because therapists are basically story editors. Their stories isn't working anymore. And often it's because they get causation wrong. They think they're to blame for things that are not their fault. And they think 
the things they really are their fault, they blame others. And so you got to iron out their story to get the causation right. And so when I'm listening to people tell their story, the first thing I'm listening for is their tone of voice. Like, are they sassy? Are they ironic? Are they cruel? Are they loud? And so the tone of voice, uh, it's, it says a lot about the persona of the person. How confident are they in themselves? Do they think the world is absurd? Or do they think it's inspiring? And you can tell a lot from the tone of voice. Then the second thing I'm looking for is the plot. We each pick a plot for our lives. And some people, you meet them, their plot is rags to riches. They started out poor and they've made it and they want to tell you that story. Some people, their plot is overcoming the monster. They had an abusive parent or maybe they suffered from alcoholism. And their story is I had this challenge and I overcame the monster. And the most common plot is redemption that I was cruising along in my life, something bad happened to me, and I came back better. And that, that's sort of the story I guess I would tell in my life. But I always want to know what's, what story are they telling? And then the final thing I want to know when I'm listening to somebody's stories is, what role are they playing? And so I was reading, for example, this great memoir by the actress Viola Davis. And she's a fighter. Like she, she grew up in extreme poverty. And she writes in there and scene after scene where my sisters and I walked down the street as a troop. We were a unit. You were not going to mess with us. So she's like the fighter. Other people are like the healer. Mm, yeah. Some people are the scholar. And even though I'm a journalist, I think my role is teacher. My great pleasure comes from learning smart stuff from other people and then sharing it with people. So I'm, I'm always listening for stories. And I'm trying to get my conversations to be story conversations. So there's this psychologist, Jerome Bruner, who says we think in two different modes. We think in paradigmatic mode, which is like an argument or a PowerPoint deck or a presentation or strategy memo, and then that narrative mode. And if we want to study science or something, we want to be in paradigmatic mode. If we want to write a newspaper column, probably paradigmatic mode. But if we want to know about a person, we want them to tell stories. And so even as a journalist, I no longer ask people, what do you think about this? I ask them, how did you come to believe this? Then they start telling me it's some experience or some person who gave them their values. And it's just way more interesting if I can get them into story mode. This shift between paradigmatic mode and narrative mode, this sounds like something that has been a change for you, that you basically decided that narrative mode is more important for understanding the world, which is to say more specifically, understanding the people around you, right? Uh, and that you, you're, you're choosing to spend more time in narrative mode, right? And less time in this, in this yeah. a analytical mode. Uh, and, that's a, and that's a choice. But I, I think yeah, I try to do a little balance of both. So for example, I have a chapter in there on personality types. You know, just as a geologist, they can study a rock face better because they know the different kinds of rock. If I know the different kinds of personality types, I'm going to know something about you. If I know you're conscientious, then I know you're very self-disciplined. I know you're probably good at exercise regimes. You're good at losing weight, but maybe you're a little rigid. And so I have that template in my head. It helps me see you the way you fit the template and the way you don't. And so I'm going to want to know a lot about the general patterns of human nature, but then I'm going to apply it to you, the unique person you are. You know, you've mentioned science a few times. I go into this only a little in the book, but I spent a lot of time talking to neuroscientists about perception. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the way perception works is not the way I thought it worked. I thought we open our eyes and, you know, data floods in. But if we tried to do that, there would be too much data. Our brain couldn't handle it. So the mind, it turns out, is sending out predictions or models of what it expects to see and then checking with the eyes to make sure the models are right. Yeah. So it's prediction correction. Or as Anil Seth, a, a great neuroscientist, said, it's a controlled hallucination. Yes. We're hallucinating the world and then we're trying to make sure our hallucination is roughly accurate. Yeah. And so with that in mind, when we see another person, we have to understand they're creating their own world with their own models. And it's a miracle at all we see the same world. But we should certainly not presume it's going to be automatic that the way you see things is going to be the way I see things. In fact, it's very unlikely. And so that's why conversation is so important. I just have to ask you over and over again, well, how do you see things? And here's how I th see things and how interesting that it's different. I'm curious to know, we were, we were talking earlier about, about storytelling. And you mentioned that you tell the story of your own life probably as a story of redemption. 
how would you tell the story of your own life? You know, I tell the story of my life as trying to go deeper throughout my life. I was always an average person with above average communication skills. In 11th grade English, the teacher, Mrs. Doosnap, said to me, David, you're trying to get by on glibness. Stop it. And on the one hand, I was humiliated because she called me out in front of the whole room. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I thought, wow, she really knows me well. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I had this phenomenally lucky career. My career has been way above any expectations where I had a few lucky breaks. I met William F. Buckley at the right moment. He gave me a job out of some miracle connection. And then I got it. I just, it was a more successful career than I ever thought. But I found that career success fails to satisfy, which most everybody finds. And then about 10 years ago, I went through a really hard season of divorce and sadness and paying the price for not having these social values. Mm. And so there was a lot of loneliness and a, an absence of really good friends who I could hang out with on the weekends. So I went through this valley and I wrote this book, The Second Mountain, about this period in life. Yeah. And I said, you know, you go in the first mountain, you, which you think is your career, you're going to build your identity, you get knocked off the mountain. You're in the valley. And I quoted a theologian, Paul Tillich, who said that suffering interrupts your life and reminds you you're not the person you thought you were. It carves through what you thought was the floor of the basement of your soul and reveals a cavity below, and then carves through that and reveals a cavity below. So in those tough moments, you, you see a lot deeper into yourself than ever before, and you realize that only sort of relational food or moral food is going to fill those deep spaces. So in 2013, I went through a lot of a very sad period, 2014, listened to a lot of very sad Irish music, like mm -hmm. Sinead O'Connor was just about the happiest thing on my playlist. So, you know, <laughs> um, but then I grew and you, you know, you can either be broken by misfortune or broken open. And I hope I was broken open. I became more vulnerable, more open. And so that's the little tale I tell myself. It's a journey of a guy trying to become more human. Well, on the topic of isolation and periods of challenge. I think it's fair to say that 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 our nation is going through a period of of challenge uh, in terms psychologically, right? It's kind of a fraught moment in history when you look at levels of of depression, of of a collapse of trust. Do you want to share some of the statistics about where we are as a country right now? Yeah, it's just weird that we're going through this sort of social and relational crisis. And it shows up in a million statistics, the rising mental health problems, rising depression rates, rising suicide, suicides up by about a third since 2000 among teenagers. It's up much higher. But then there are weirder ones, like the number of people who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times since 2000. The number of people who say they have less than five friends has gone up since 2000. The number of people who are not in a romantic relationship has gone up by a third since that time. Two generations ago, if you ask people, do you trust your neighbors? 60% say they trust their neighbors. Now it's down to 30% and 19% of millennials. The younger you are, the more distrustful you are because society has been untrustworthy. And so in statistic after statistic, you just see a country that's sad. And when people feel unseen, unrecognized, unfriended, they regard it as an injustice, which it is, and they lash out. Yeah. And so periods of sadness leads to periods of meanness. And along with all the sad statistics, I could cite you a bunch of mean statistics, hate crimes going up, gun violence, indiscipline in school. And so it's just a social breakdown. And I've learned over the, these years, you can't have a healthy democracy on top of a sick and rotten society. Mm. And so I started, you know, nominally as a political columnist, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I realized our key problems are in politics, but they're downstream from a deeper set of problems in our society. And the book is meant to be a little ray of, of hope. Like, here's how we can actually treat each other better and build trust. You, if we can't build trust, you can't build trust with somebody who doesn't understand you. And so this skill of seeing others and being deeply seen is the precondition for rebuilding trust. And if your society doesn't have trust, it, it doesn't have a lot. Yeah. And, and when, a, when, a, when a population, when a collection of people is isolated and dispirited, it, it opens up opportunities for demagogues, doesn't it? Is it? How does this relate to what you call the politics of recognition? Yeah. Well, when you feel invisible, you want somebody who will recognize you. 
Yeah. And if you're, say, in the Midwest in a former steel town and you feel you've been left behind by the economy, but not only that, the people who run the media, the people who run the universities, the people who run Hollywood, they're all from a class that has nothing to do with you and they seem to look down on you, you're going to lash out and you're going to find somebody who can make you feel seen. And demagogues do that. And then what happens is everything becomes politicized because politics gives the illusion that you're going to get what you want. It gives you the illusion of a moral landscape. There's the good guys and the bad guys. It gives you the illusion of community. I'm on my Republican team or my Democratic team. But these are all illusions. Politics doesn't give you real community. You're not like mm-hmm. hanging out with yeah. each other. You're just hating the same thing. You're not really doing moral action like sitting with the widow or feeding the hungry. You're just like getting indignant on Twitter. And so politics is a false form of social therapy that people have leapt into. But now our late night comedy is politicized. Our sports are politicized. Everything's politicized. Mm-hmm. And we've become over politicized and under moralized as a society. We we talk about politics too much and relationships and being considerate too little. One of the things I learned from this philosopher Max Honeth is his name, that every society has a recognition order, what he calls a recognition order. And in a fair society, everybody's recognized. In our society, only a few people are given a lot of recognition, mostly the highly educated, highly affluent, highly good looking. <laughs> and so we have a scarcity of respect or a maldistribution of respect. And part of the book is to try to redistribute respect more broadly than it is right now. Do you think that we can kind of interaction by interaction, dinner party by dinner party, block party by block party, (laughs) is there a pathway towards really fundamentally changing the dynamics in our country? Well, Well, just what do you think? I'd see it in my own life that I'm my relationships are just richer because I my way of being in the world is richer. Yeah, with most people in the world, you can begin to develop a stronger understanding of each other. And I really think there's an ideology going around that you can never really understand another. And of course you can't all the way. We can't understand ourselves all the way. But I've read books of history where the historian is writing about people who lived in very different technological era, say the Middle Ages, very different cultural era. And yet you really feel an identity with the people she's writing about. Zadie Smith is a great novelist. Yeah. And she had a passage in an essay she wrote recently, she she was calling her own girlhood. And she said, when I was playing in my friend's house, I would try to imagine what it would be like to never leave. What it would be like to grow up in this house, whether they were Ghanaian or Bangladesh or from from Ireland or whatever. And she said, I was an equal opportunity voyeur. And I thought, what a great way, A, to prepare yourself to be a novelist, like imagining all these other lives. But what a great way to prepare yourself to be a good student of other human beings. And I just have to think in a a world that's getting more dehumanized, that anything we can do that's humanizing, that tries to see the world from another point of view, that's got to be a good. (laughs) I don't know if it'll change the world, but it's got to be a good thing to do on its own. And which is to say that that the humanities themselves are humanizing. I think there can be a point of view that fiction is frivolous, but these exercises in, in understanding people, understanding other human minds, it's really what all of art is about on some level and and right. and it's important and it's a you know, it seems to be a force for good yeah i know a, a guy who when he gets cranky his wife asks him do you have a novel going and if he doesn't she'll say please read a novel it, it makes you a little happier <laughs> and calmer and but i do think you know people s- students of mine will say well i can't major in the liberal arts they're too impractical and i say Liberal arts are the most practical thing that you can major in because they teach you about other people. Yeah. And if you don't know about other people, you'll be miserable and you'll make them miserable. Uh, and it's rarely, frankly, the students. It's I, it, I'll, I'll, Just once I want a student to come up to me and say, you know, I really want to major in accounting, but my parents are forcing me to major in French poetry. Like, <laughs> yeah. That'll never happen because the parents are the ones who are putting the pressure on the students to major in something that they think is professional. But AI is going to swallow up a lot of those skills yes. anyway. So you might as well be get really good at understanding people. That's right. There's an irony about this notion that the extraordinary work of some very sophisticated coders over time has resulted in a kind of emerging technological capability, which is pushing us towards focusing on more human skills, uh, which are perhaps better informed by the humanities, like prompt engineering. 
which is how we, we're interacting with LLMs, large language models, AI, is, is uh, I think people tend to be better at prompt engineering if they have more experience with playing with language, right? Um, yeah. So it, 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 it could be that that counsel coming from parents to their children will change in the next five to 10 years with this in mind, right? It could be. But, you know, the LLMs are really good at, at obviously synthesizing massive amounts of data to create a generalization about things. But to know one particular human being, yes, uh, that's something that we're better. And I, I do think one. Of, I'm more pro optimistic about AI than the average American. I think we've introduced a, a new form of intelligence into the world, and we're going to be able to use it to a lot, do a lot of great things. But um, I do think it's going to reveal who we are by what it can't do. And I do think there are certain skills, and I spend a lot of time talking to neuroscientists about this, that. Um, it just won't be able to do it. It's phenomenal at some things, but you know, sometimes I'll hear an AI researcher say, we're going to uh, ma make machines that think like people do. And I'll go to a neuroscientist and I ask them, what do they think? And they say, well, that would be a nice trick because we don't know how people think. So uh, the human mind is way more complicated than even a, a large language model in my view. Yes. No, I think that's true. Although th this may be where the difference of faith kicks in because Though I think it's true that large language models today, the way they're built, are not in the process of becoming conscious or becoming or developing human level intelligence. If one believes that human intelligence and consciousness is something that's an emergent property that came with with a scale of the, the size of the brains that we have with, yes, some specialization, but not widely different from the brains of all other animals, though there may be some new forms of AI that will be necessary. It may take decades, not years. It does seem like there's a there, there's a pathway towards that, w yeah. which is which is humbling. I, I we'll see, you know, but you know, I don't think I, we don't know how consciousness emerges. So true, <laughs> but I, I'm, it could be because it just emerges from the scale. But I, I'm not sure of that. And you know, I, I think I see humans doing a lot of things that AI so far doesn't really seem to be doing, like understanding. Yes, yeah or having motivations and desires. I mean, AI is great at mimicking a lot of human things, but it's not great at actually being a human. Yeah. And so I, I still think it's an it and not, a, not an entity, not an animal yet. You know, I think it could be useful to take a step back and tell you a little bit more about why we do what we do at the Next Big Idea Club. We do it because our lives have been transformed by books. Fresh ideas from the world's great thinkers we find both fascinating and useful. And yet we know that books can be really long. And we have limited time. We know that you're busy. There is a universe of brilliant ideas stuck in books trying to get out, trying to get into your ears. So we created the Next Big Idea app, which delivers the key insights from the best new books directly into your ears in only 12 minutes from the authors themselves. This part is important. Other book summary apps summarize books without permission from the authors who deliver the heart and soul of these books. We want to give you the authentic article, and we want to help authors succeed. We want their ideas to be discovered. And we hope that after downloading our app, you will also buy their books. Every time someone downloads our app and every time someone subscribes and joins our community, it puts a bounce in the step of all of the nine amazing members of the Next Big Idea Club team, guaranteed. You subscribe and you will put a bounce in our step, maybe two. Please join us. Just search for Next Big Idea wherever you get your apps. There is no better way to get smart fast and no better way to put a bounce in our steps. Download the Next Big Idea app right now. Well, I want to pose to you one of the big questions you offer in your how to have good conversations section. If the next five years is a chapter in your life, what is that chapter about? Yeah, so I've had a good run professionally. And I, I used to, about 10 years ago, had really have good local community. And so I had like I was lucky enough to have a column in the New York Times and and I appear on the PBS News Hour. So that was all wonderful. But I was absent really the local um deep roots. And then I got in in, in about ten years ago, we joined congregation, joined um this extended family of, of DC kids. Uh but over COVID all that blew up there. The kids aged out, they grew up and moved away. And so 
I'm without a, a the kind of locally rooted community that I think would be a good balance for the stuff I do at work. So I think my wife and I are both very intent. We we need to find a a, a chosen family. We need to find a, a local community that's rooted in a place that we can really plug into. And so I, I think the next five years, aside from doing all the work I do in public, we'll be trying to find an, the kind of rooted community we experienced before. Yeah, I've I've had a bit of a view that that the way that we live today as Homo sapiens, everyone in their own white box, you know, <laughs> sort of separated, may be suboptimal. Like there are some countries where where they're building a half dozen apartments that share a central kitchen, or their their alternative. Is, this is a real interest for me in the second half of my life. Is is how can we rethink how we actually design how humans, you know, right. live live together? Yeah. And I'm glad that um, now uh, when the home builders ask people, would you like a senior suite in your the home we're going to build for you? 40% of people want a senior suite. They want grandma and grandpa to move in to help raise the kids. So right. we're seeing more three-generation households than before. If I could just tell one more story based on what, what you said. So I, this is a story that I, I read a couple of years ago, and it was about the 18th century colonies, American colonies. And so the European civil settlers are on the East Coast. And occasionally, somebody, they would, one of them would get kidnapped by the Indian, by the natives. And uh, they would try to rescue them from being kidnapped. And the Europeans would hide. They didn't want to get rescued. And there was this big population flow from the European settlers to go live with the natives. But there was no population flow of natives who wanted to go live with the settlers. And the Europeans, like Benjamin Franklin, was very bothered by this. We're, we're the better civilization. And yet it, it was because in the native communities, they had community yeah, yeah <laughs> and they exactly. were, they felt embraced by the yeah. whole tribe or yeah. whatever. And so it, it makes you think our whole civilization is, is maladapted that we have yeah. we're not an, like answering some basic human truths. And the reverse was also true that when Native Americans were raised in, in with the colonists, the first chance they had, they would run back to their tribes and never right. return. <laughs> so it was a, right. People were voting with their feet in, in very clear ways. Yeah, yeah that, that's something so. to learn from that. Well, thank you so much, David. Is, is there anything else uh, that we didn't cover that, that, that you'd like to share? No, I enjoyed it. I think we've covered the waterfront. I can't think of anything vital that we didn't touch. Amazing. Well, thank you, David, for taking time to be with us today. I, I really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for reading the book. And uh, I appreciate your attention. And I enjoyed being together. David Brooks is an opinion columnist for The New York Times and author of The Social Animal, The Second Mountain, The Road to Character, and most recently, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. He's also partnered with the Aspen Institute to start something called Weave, The Social Fabric Project that aims to tackle the problem of broken trust that has left Americans divided, lonely, and in social gridlock. You can learn more about it by following the link in the episode notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can do the usual thing and leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and so on. Or you could do something even better. Follow me, Rufus Griscom, on LinkedIn. Sign up for my newsletter. It's called The Next Big Idea. And leave a comment on my post about this episode. I'd love to know what you think of David's work. Has it inspired you to get to know someone more deeply? Does this resonate for you? Do you think we can really improve things dinner party by dinner party, block party by block party? It'd certainly be fun to try. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please don't be shy. Today's episode was written, edited, and produced by Caleb Bissinger. Sound designed by the effortlessly talented Mike Toda. The entire team at the LinkedIn Podcast Network looks at us with just and loving attention whenever we see them on Microsoft Teams. I'm Rufus Griscom, and I'll see you, really see you next week.